Okay, today I have Colonel Tony Schaefer on to go over what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, what's going on with Iran, Israel, and the Red Sea, and what's going on here at home. Colonel Schaefer, thank you for joining me today. Stephen, I always enjoy our conversations. Thanks for having me. So uh, this morning, former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev threatened to drop nuclear bombs on Washington, D.C., Berlin, and London if NATO attempts to force, forcefully take back any of Russia's territory prior to the, a 1991 agreement. Is there any sincerity in this, or is this a barking dog, or is he really drawing a line that hey, listen, we're willing to negotiate on this Ukraine thing, but don't try to take an inch of Russia? Uh, no, I think he's completely serious. And they have both the nuclear weapons and tactical capability to make it make it happen. Um, what he's referring to, and I've got a copy here. Basically, back in 91, I don't know if the audience can see that, there was an agreement made between uh, the United States and Russia. It was kind of a handshake agreement. But basically, the agreement was by James Baker, Secretary of the State then, we understand the need for assurances to the countries in the East, Russia, that we maintain a, a presence in Germany, that, and that is part of NATO. And there would be no extension of NATO jurisdictions or forces of NATO one inch to the East. Well, we know that didn't. that is not the case. So I think the Russians have seen this, uh, this agreement broken, and they feel that uh, their backs are against the wall. And I've said this before, the reason for this, the Russian paranoia is that they have been invaded a lot over the history of their nation. Vladimir Putin did a, a good recitation. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin, I, I recommend you go see it. It's got a lot of views, over 2 million last time I checked. Uh, full disclosure, I did text with Tucker. I just said, hey, good job. I, he didn't give me any feedback. He just said it was a wild experience. I have no insight other than you know that, that casual text with Tucker. But um, I do know that the Russian paranoia is based as a as a as a foundational concept of of their their national security, and it goes back to a, a series of invasions going back to 1237, the Mongols, Ottoman Empire, 1570, the Swedes with the meatballs, 1708, the French, 1812, a little guy named Napoleon. I think there's a movie out on it right now. Uh, it's, uh, Japan, 1905. Uh, the U.S. intervention, we helped uh, the whites back in 1918. And of course, uh, a, a little guy named Adolf Hitler, 1941. So their paranoia is based on history. And you're not going to change the trajectory of their internal uh, angst relating to feeling that Russia is worth defending. Now, I'll say this in addition to that, Putin's numbers, not Medvedev, but he's, you know, works for Putin, essentially, Putin's numbers are 80% approval. American presidents would kill for that level of approval, Stephen. And he, 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 those numbers are high because of what Medvedev said. We are not going to allow the West to undermine Russia. Many people in Russia, like Victoria Nuland and all these other folks in the Biden administration, have actually been working to use Ukraine as a lever to destabilize and, and basically collapse Russia. So these are all the things on the table. I don't think for a minute the Russians are bluffing at this point when they say you do you you know you continue this effort to poke the bear to use a proverb. Uh, I I don't think they're going to back down at this point. Okay, I mean it would kind of be like if Biden took a very aggressive pro-America stance and said not another illegal immigrant in. We're going to close the border. We're going to put America first in every single way. His he would probably rise in the polls. Maybe not right. back to eighty but certainly not at 33, um, but they don't do that. They continue to have this loose border, right. um, a allow all kinds of shenanigans within the country, and then they wonder why only 33% of people think that he's doing a good job. Um, so, but that that's good to know that, uh, you know, they, and I would imagine, I think uh, Scott Ritter said under Russian doctrine that they would have to be attacked first but any attempt to take part of Russia would be considered an attack. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I do believe that Scott is correct on that. I mean, it, the, the closest analog that I think within uh, my history, not necessarily your history, was when I, the, literally the, board, the month I was born, 1962, um, was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I have no doubt during the time, and I've watched the videos, I've read the, 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 the events, 
Kennedy would have responded with nuclear weapons in some in some way, I think, uh, regarding uh, Cuba. If the Russians maintained nuclear weapons and attempted to use them, I think we would have considered first strike. I'm just saying, based on everything I've read, because the idea is you go to a certain line, it's like, you know, if you if we don't act, there's a lack of credibility. That lack of credibility will result in our losing. And I think, uh, to your point, yeah, if Biden all of a sudden grew a backbone and said, look, I've made a mistake. These are the things that I think we should address as Americans that will help unify, protect, and, and assure the American people that we're going to have a strong economy. We're going to have a secure border. We're going to try to focus on how we can to, to put our interests first and then help others as we can. It's not America first, Stephen, just for those who don't seem to understand it. It's not about America only. It's America first. We become an, an established well, uh, well, uh, I, I'm trying to think of the right words. The, the, a a well-established economy that is pros prosperous for American people, and that prosperity can be essentially something good for the world, for the globe. And and, and we do want to help with others. I don't believe for a minute Putin, Putin uh, that uh, Trump's going to pull us out of, of NATO. I'm just saying that the idea should be how do we enrich our own people and secure our own borders and do those things necessary to, to make us a strong country before we consider helping others. So, yeah, it's the, uh, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first before you help your Absolutely. neighbor. You know, yep. we're, we're over here floundering. Most of the country's living paycheck to paycheck. Literally. They're, they're funneling on in all this cheap labor, gobbling up jobs. It's especially hurting certain communities, lower income families, the black community, um, and I don't, I don't think they see what's coming down the pike for them, but if you were to strengthen those things, I, I think it would be a totally different, uh, ball game, but I don't think they will change them. And that's why more and more people are moving away from the Democrat party. So, uh, yeah, let me hit that real quick because, uh, you know, I'm running for office here in Chowan County where I live for, as for County commissioner. And I'm out meeting with a lot of folks. I actually attended the NAACP banquet a few weeks ago and, um, I can tell you there's a lot of, of discontent with their with the uh, Democrat Party. When you see, Stephen, illegal aliens coming in and being enriched to the level uh, that they are, where uh, veterans, many of the uh, the black uh, uh, residents of this county are veterans, uh, some of them disabled. Uh, and then you have a very poor community here that, that they do recognize they're not being given the benefits that other communities are re regarding the illegal aliens. Yeah, there's a huge amount of discontent. And uh, the, the, the the minority communities that have traditionally been part of the Democrat Party are not thriving. They're, as a matter of fact, I think they see themselves as being victimized, rightly in this case, by the way, by their own party. And and I, I've heard this a lot from folks within within uh, the minority community here. And it is, it's not me. It's like, it's your party. It's not us. So yeah. I don't know what to tell you. So, yeah. Uh, speaking of parties, uh, Biden has called for Speaker Mike Johnson and top Republicans to do a sit down meeting at the White House with Ukraine, getting Ukraine more money as the top priority. Do you think he'll bow down to the White House pressure or do you think he is committed to getting something for the border if he's going to give something for Ukraine? Every time this has come up so far, uh, I'm very proud that Speaker Johnson's held the line. So I'd like to believe he'll continue that because clearly Biden wasn't into this conversation. I was reading a political article on this very thing when we were, I was prepping for our discussion today, Stephen. And um, Politico noted that that Johnson had been willing to sit down and talk, but had been rebuffed by the White House. So uh, basically, uh, the, the, the mountains coming to Mohammed, if I can use a metaphor, yeah. Uh, by the fact that, yeah, Biden recognizes that the, the numbers aren't there. And again, I think even though his party continues to speak out in favor of Ukraine, I think even the Democrat Party recognizes that there's a lot of issues that 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 go against uh, a pro-Ukrainian stance. And let me be very clear on this, because the fall of Avdievka, which I think I got right for the first time, uh, it only helps remind people that the 300 billion we've given over the past uh, 10 years, this goes back to 2014, uh, has been wasted. Uh, the end result was not victory. And again, let me be very clear for this. I wanna be very clear for you and your audience, because we've we've talked about this for the past year, Stephen. Um, the numbers were never there. There was no victory possible for the Ukrainians over the Russians, period. 
Now, I got a lot of blowback at the, when we first started saying this last year because, oh, I'm pro-Putin. No, I'm not pro-Putin. Putin is a thug. As I've said on a number of interviews, you can take the man out of the Soviet. You can't take the Soviet out of the man. He's still a Soviet. He still governs from a very strong position. He essentially has become, because he's about to go for his next run as, uh, to win presidency for another six years, he has become a modern czar. He, it is what it is. And for us to dispute that or pretend it doesn't exist, it only results in this feckless foreign policy and lack of military strategy that results in the death of a whole generation of Ukraines without any anything to gain for it. So yes, the, that's a long way of answering your question. That yes, I I think Speaker Johnson has both the winds of 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 momentum regarding the fact that many of us who have been critical of the war were correct, and it's time for Biden to reconsider the entirety of his strategy relating to just throwing money at 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 the Ukraine issue and hoping for the best. Yeah, I think uh, losing at Ad, Advetka. <laughs> it's a tough. It's a tough uh, yeah. word to say. Losing that town uh, that starts with an A, right as they're having this meeting, does not bode well for the Democrat side. Saying, "Oh, we, we just need to throw more good money at a bad problem." Right. Where you know we're not even throwing good money at our own bad problem on on the exactly. Border. So hopefully they will hold that line. Um, want to want to get your uh, take on Vice President Kamala Harris and the the speech that she gave at the Munich Security Conference. She said a Rush, Russia's attack on Ukraine has been an utter failure for Russia. Russia has lost over three hundred people, depleted their military stockpile. Harris said that Russia is so beat down they've had to dip into their prison system and force recruitment in order to bolster the Russian Federation Army. We know that there's some truth in here, but it's being twisted into a fashion that makes it sound like this is a boxing match and Russia is in their last breath. They're on the ropes when in reality, they're Muhammad Ali standing over the body. Uh, it, it, it's it's a done fight. What are your thoughts on her comments? No, this is unhelpful. This is unhelpful to the American people. It's unhelpful to the, the Ukrainians who are completely demoralized by the fact that they've now figured out they've been lied to by their own government. I think this is her comments to simply add fuel to the fire of a potential revolution of a coup d'etat in in Ukraine. I mean, this is this is uh, this is not even. I don't think people would write a Hollywood script for this level of B movie, Stephen. Uh, they they limited her comments, by the way. They kept her from taking a lot of questions for obvious reasons. And uh, what she said was was I used to talk say that they were they would promote aspirationist policy. This is an aspiration. This is this is uh, science fiction, because uh, let's let's go through the facts. Were were uh, Russian prisoners being given the opportunity to fight? Absolutely. Uh, uh, Wagner went around and recruited all sorts of murderers. And gee, I don't know. Maybe murderers on the battlefield isn't a bad thing because apparently they kicked ass. And I, I'm not justifying the actions. I'm just saying, yeah, they did that. But this other thing about uh, the, 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 their economy and all these other things that have been uh, damaged. No, uh, the economy is doing well. I think it's growing at 3% this year, which many things said would never happen. It is. Putin's at 80%, as I mentioned, 80% approval rate. Uh, they've they bypassed sanctions. Stephen, the Indians admitted on stage that they keep, they're keeping their op options open by allowing the sale of Russian oil to them, and then they sell them to the third parties. So it's like, Nobody takes anything she says or the Biden administration seriously. There's no credibility. These people have no leverage over ordering a steak for dinner at this point because nobody believes them, Stephen. And that's the worst possible position of a nation of our strength and our uh, uh, past prestige to be in, to have no leverage, to no, have no credibility on the world stage. And that's where we're at. Let's switch gears. Um, we've we've got uh, the the Houthis uh, launching drones and and rockets. They they just sank this morning. It was announced that they sank a a UK cargo ship. It's it's finally starting to go under. Um, it, it's been almost asymmetrical warfare. It where has it used to be. Hey, we have the million dollar rockets. Therefore, asymmetrically, we have the advantage. Now these little drone attacks have been pretty asymmetrical, but. Uh, my my question for you is: Do you see this situation in the Middle East escalating, 
or is it starting to de-escalate? No, it's not going to de-escalate. Uh, let me run through why, three reasons. First, they're winning. The Houthi are winning. They're taking on the greatest military on the planet, uh, theoretically, with essentially $1,000 drones, which can be essentially manufactured rapidly against million-dollar weapon systems. And who's winning? Well, they are. At this point, they, they the Houthi, have disrupted 25% of all global shipping. 25%. Now, 12%, roughly 12% goes through the Red Sea, or used to, because it's not 12% now. But that, but the fact that you've 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 been able to degrade the, the security of, of shipping through that area, through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, you're defunding one of our key allies, the, the, the Egyptians. The Egyptians make a lot of their money off of shipping going through the, the through the Suez Canal. Well, that's that's affecting our one of our closest allies, who, by the way, trying to help us on the Israeli issue with the, with the Hamas folks. That's bad. You've now impacted globally uh, on costs. I've seen gas costs go up uh, 50 cents over the past week, at least here, uh, two weeks. Uh, that's impacting uh, economy. It's making people rethink how they move uh, shipping around uh, that region. So a, little, a group of guys who run around in the back of Toyota 4x4s with AK-47s with a few drones have been able to upend the global economy. Think about that. Uh, and of course, why? Why is this happening? Because the Iranians have decided that they're going to affect this in the way that they have. They have been the ones uh, who have both put the Houthi up to this. The government of, of Yemen has said, uh, the Biden administration has done this. This is the government of, of Yemen has said this publicly about a month ago. It's not, we can't do anything about it because the Biden administration gave all this money to the Iranians and the Iranians are overwhelming us. We can't stop the Houthi. And, and oh, by the way, we have held back the Saudis from going into Yemen to deal with this. So the Saudis are natural ally who have been after the Houthi because the Houthi have been after them. We've held them back. So all the things that, that the United States has done regarding policy has only inflamed this. We are literally paying for both sides of this by the release of funds and by another sanction busting. The Iranians are selling all sorts of of, of, of their uh, petroleum-based products to China, thirty billion plus dollars at least per per year, maybe more. Uh, and then also now you've you've seen the Biden administration release funds that were frozen. So Stephen, at this point, we are literally funding the chaos that we are now experiencing, and our allies should be furious with us because we have created the conditions for this level of of um, of impact, negative impact on global economy. And uh, I don't see it slowing down because, you know, there's the, the policy is to, to not win. Uh, I am not blaming the Fifth Fleet, who's in, in combat with these guys. There's been a number of articles about this. Let me put it this way. You know, my, my friend, uh, Brigadier General Blaine Holt, and I talk about this on a regular basis. If he and I were put in charge, the, the Houthi would be out of business within 48 hours uh, with the current uh, U.S. forces there. Because what we're doing, 90% of all strikes are going towards training camps, which are no, not even uh, currently manned. And they're doing virtue signaling against the Iranians. Oh, yeah, we're after the IRGC. No, they're not. The, the, one of the reasons the Houthi are so effective is because the intelligence being used to drive these attacks are from Iranian ships, intelligence ships, collecting information, giving them feedback, giving them what we call battle damage assessment, being able to further uh, att attenuate the ability of... Uh, of uh, basically to to expand the the, the ability of the uh, of uh, of the Houthi to hit accurately and basically attenuating our ability to respond rapidly because they they tell them when to move and how to move. So these things are ongoing now. So again, why would the Houthi or the Iranians stop when they're winning? And the whole idea here is they want to diminish and influence the world, uh, the the shipping in that world because the Iranians have decided they want to become much more prominent. Uh, in the dominating the, the region, which they've been doing through their proxies. Yeah. I, I read uh, that one naval admiral said that they're actually, the U.S. military is learning a lot about modern warfare by going up against the Houthis. Number one, that's pretty scary. It is. To at least learn the lessons if you're going to have issues. But then the last thing he said is, this is, this is the most the U.S. Navy has uh, had to deal with as far as battle goes since World War II. And so it'll be really interesting to see where where this thing goes. But 
my my gut tells me just based off everybody that I'm speaking with, what I'm reading, that this thing is is going to continue to escalate, not de-escalate. You seem to I be agree with the same you. opinion. Yeah, I do. So again, there's no reason that uh, that they would stop uh, as they uh, as they the Iranians, with their proxies, especially the Houthis, see more and more success. They will continue to expand their effort to conduct what you called rightly asymmetric warfare. Now. The way you deal with asymmetric warfare, Stephen, is understanding their centers of gravity and attacking them. Again, I, I have a pretty good understanding of where those are at, but the Biden administration, as a matter of policy, is refusing to go after those. I'm not calling for war with Iran. It is not necessary. It would be counterproductive. And frankly, you know, the idea of destabilizing Iran uh, externally is not a good idea. I think they have many internal stresses that would be available to us to kind of encourage their own instability internally without us having to lift a, a weapon. And it, it is simply uh, the unwillingness of the Biden administration to accept the reality which we face, there's there's a clue for you, rather than trying to push aspirations onto their discussions with the Iranians regarding their nuclear program. This is all about the Biden administration trying to push and get the Iranians back on a the joint agreed upon framework regarding their nuclear program, which the Iranians see and understand that that's, that's what they want. They'll continue to discuss that potential, but they, at the same time, recognize the Biden administration is not willing to do anything to counter their expanded aggression and successful aggression all throughout the, the, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. Yeah. Well, and I Iran is not what it was in the 90s, and, and it now has the backing of Russia. Yep. They, they, their, their partnership and alliance has grown significantly their partnerships with China, like a $450 billion oil contract over a 20 yep. year period. The yep. money is just flowing like crazy to Iran. That should have been the United States when we were energy uh, dominant under Trump. And now year over year, we haven't produced another gallon of oil. Uh, Saudi Arabia has lowered their oil. Iran has uh, lowered their oil. So yeah, it's uh, it, it's a terrible situation that we're in, and we just have to hope and pray that leaders in command that we can't just remove make wise decisions until they can be removed in this upcoming election. I think that's the answer, and, and let me speak. And I've I've spoken about this to your audience before. I've got a degree in environmental studies. Uh, this whole idea that CO two is a a, a a pollutant is insane. Uh, there's no evidence of any credible source I've looked at saying that the world is going to cook, that we're going to doom ourselves. As a matter of fact, if we continue to, to try to, 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 to lower CO2, if we're successful, we could actually upend our ability or our planet's ability to generate uh, green crops. I mean, uh, plants use CO2, Stephen. And if we don't have plants, we don't have oxygen. If we don't have oxygen, a lot of things start failing. So the, the whole effort I'm seeing Go, is 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 not only uh, counterproductive; it's dangerous. And so, I don't believe for a minute that we're going to, you know, your kids, my kids, my our grandkids are going to suffer the consequences of global warming because it's a fiction. And and uh, the whole idea that we're going to el eliminate petro petrochemicals from our lives is insane. Right now, I can guarantee you, you are touching something that came from petroleum. Even either the chair you're sitting on, the desk you're at, something you have. This is all petroleum. This all comes from petroleum. And the idea that all of a sudden we're going to take that out, uh, what are we going to replace it with? You know, uh, beehive uh, leavings? I mean, th there's no there's no replacing it. And the idea somehow that this fiction that 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 carbon is the enemy, CO2 is the enemy, that that we have to stop doing this is is counterproductive and only enriching and enabling those adversaries we've been talking about to benefit. This whole this whole effort by Joe Biden and, and the green movement to deprive our economy of necessary resources such as inexpensive energy, oil, is, is one of the, the fundamental things which is destabilizing the West and is going to result in the ultimate collapse of the American economy if this continues the, the direction the left wants it to, to, get, to go. Yeah. I'll, I'll bet you if you researched it, uh, the control of oil and petrol products has been one of the single largest things to pull a country out of poverty. Absolutely. In, yeah, into being a superpower. Um, and, and so uh, people can research on that. 
Uh, Colonel Schaefer, I want to thank you for coming on. If people sure. continue to follow you online, what's the best way for them to do that? So um, our umbrella organization now we're trying to, to run, which is always tough, think tanks are tough to run, is uh, projectsentinel.com or .net. Uh, go check us out there. A lot of the stuff we're doing, our priorities are all there. A lot of the interviews I do, you know, I, I do a lot of interviews. Just today I'm doing like a dozen. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to both inform uh, and uh, educate and entertain. We, we'd like to try to be a little bit uh, on the edge as we talk about things to, to put a little irony into things. And then obviously my, my radio program, which uh, is a weekly program, uh, The Hard Truth with Tony Schaefer. We go through and do a, a, a long format interview on a, everything from Cherie Curry and the Runaways and rock and roll and and DEI issues relating to the the uh, the, the real problems with um, the uh, the use of uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, uh, this transgender issue against our kids. Uh, everything from that to discussions of Afghanistan. The hard science relating to global warming. So we do a little bit of everything and try to make it so that it is, like I said, informative uh, and, and entertaining as well. So uh, Stephen, I always enjoy our conversations. This went really fast. I always enjoy being here with you. So thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.